What's up, Ascenders? This is episode 11 of Awaken with Nutrigenome Mix Expert, Terry Cochran. Here's what's coming up. And so now what we're seeing is all of these nutritional nutritional diseases has been linked then back to these genes that have been turned on against our favor through our food and our lifestyle. What we do in our practice is we figure out how those genes get tripped on and off. We can be vibrant at any age. In our practice, we say genes are potential, they're not your destiny. Ascenders, welcome back to another episode of Awaken, the official podcast of Ascend. I'm Brian Henry, the founder of Ascend and your host. On Awaken, it's our mission to facilitate progress in the ongoing process of collective awakening, the shift to a more expansive and higher functioning state of consciousness. On the show, I explore the experiences and ideas of our special guests to support you in improving your state of health, heightening your state of consciousness, and manifesting abundance so that we may all transcend and rise to our potential. If you'd like to be a part of this movement, I invite you to join us at our Ascenders Facebook group. One of the core values or beliefs of an Ascender is that of unity and service. So in the group, what we do is we spread wisdom, inspiration, and positivity so that we can help each other grow to our potential. If you'd like to join the group, you can do so at www.togetherweascend.com forward slash community. Hope to see you guys there. Our DNA is commonly understood to be our blueprint, the instruction manual for our cells for how they should function and operate. But more specifically than that is our genetic expression is what determines how our cells function. Because you see, our genes can be either inactive or active, and it's the active genes that really influence how our cells cells function. And it's our active genes that determine what's called our gene expression. Epigenetics is the very fascinating field of research that looks at how environmental factors can actually influence and change our genetic expression. Because things like our lifestyle and our nutrition can actually cause our genes to turn active or inactive. And interestingly, Research is starting to see connections between our genetic expression, what genes we have active and inactive, and chronic disease, such as cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disorders. So our guest in this episode, Terry Cochran, is an expert in the field of nutrigenomics, which looks specifically at how our nutrition and what we eat can affect our genetic expression. Again, how our food can turn on and off certain genes. So one of the biggest learning lessons that I took from this interview was that our genetic expression can largely affect what foods are good for us at any given point in time. So Terry and I will explore both approaches, using genetic testing and just simply tuning into your body without getting any testing done so that you can truly understand what foods you should be eating. We'll also be discussing a new approach to eating that Terry has come up with that she calls the Waldetarian diet. And she'll provide a lot of scientific support for why she feels like this is the best way to proceed with how we approach our nutrition. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview. This is Terry Cochran. Terry is an integrative practitioner and international thought leader in functional epigenetic nutrition. Her and her team develop bio-individualized plans for clients through integrating knowledge and techniques from a variety of fields, including muscle testing, biophysics, and nutrigenomic evaluations. By blending cutting-edge science, epigenetics, and nutrigenomics, biomechanics, observation, listening, and nutrition, Terry helps people with a wide array of conditions and goals, from improving thyroid conditions, endocrine disorders, and viral illnesses, to working with athletes to improve athletic performance. Terry seeks to spread awareness around what she has coined the Waldetarian approach to nutrition, which we'll be learning about today, and has the book coming out in the near future to cover the topic, which I'm personally excited to get my hands on. Terry, thank you for joining us on Awaken. Oh, thank you, Brian. 
So before we dive into the the meat of the content, I would love to hear a little bit more about your story. I know that you have uh, a little bit of a, a rough background that kind of led you into the the field of work that you are, you're in today. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about that story? Sure, I'm happy to share it. Well, I actually had a corporate career and I had worked in corporate America for almost 20 years. I left after 20 years of, of that line of work, but when my first son was born, um, he was born slightly premature, and at the age of 18 months, he started developing deleterious, idiopathic, meaning nobody could figure him out. He started having brain seizures. His bone density at the age of three was that of an 18-month-old. Uh, really, really failure to thrive. He was uh, not talking, not walking, significant respiratory issues, bleeding eczema. We took him to every doctor in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area that I knew of, endocrinologist, uh, pediatrician, specialist, and no one could figure him out. And so after a while I thought, well, if no one can figure him out, I'm a solution seeker, I'm a Cuban refugee, where we live in the solution, not in the problem. I thought, well, let's see what I can do. My experience and my, my training had been in um, corporate uh, real estate, institutional thinking, strategic planning, uh, and risk management, but I needed to change the risk management to managing the risk of my child's uh, current state, uh, which was at a high risk level. And so I started doing voluminous research before the age of the internet, before Google, and literally at my kitchen table one evening, an epiphany came to me and it was, oh my gosh, it's what we're feeding him. And within five days of stopping gluten and dairy and corn and peanuts and citrus, he started breathing and then he started growing. And this was before the age of gluten-free. No one knew gluten-free or about it. But now he is a robust 23-year-old who was a junior Olympic gold medalist. He was a varsity swimmer. He was the valediction speaker at his high school and uh, was able to attain a uh, full academic right at a, a public ivy here in the U.S. Oh, so did phenomenally well he just graduated from college that's amazing and you said it took only five days before you started seeing improvements five days so this is the power of food i call food the alpha and the omega we started seeing significant differences and it took a while because i wasn't trained and then after a while after three years they used to call me dr terry at, at my job and i decided to leave it and be that light for other mothers that were told there's nothing you can do for your child mm -hmm. so here you are today helping yeah. people implement uh, better nutritional strategies so that they can undergo the same sort of healing that your, your son experienced. Exactly. So what, um, what kind of conditions do you, do you help with your clients with? Is there, uh, do you have a specialty or is it just kind of a, a huge array like the, uh, like the ones I was mentioning in the introduction there? Yeah, well, we really see anything because we get to the root of the root of any health condition, but I'm considered a specialist in autoimmune conditions, in cancer, in autism, in um, thyroid disease, um, specifically Hashimoto's, and I'm a thought leader in viral and bacterial illnesses. Okay. So I know that uh, a large part of the work you do is implementing information and knowledge from the field of nutrigenomics um, and epigenetic nutrition. So for those of the, so for those of our listeners that may not know what that field is, what's the, uh, what's the simple version of kind of what that field explores or those fields? Sure. Well, um, epigenetics is what we call the genes of you. It's our genes, our genetic, our genome, and how they might have what they call genetic defects in our genes. And they're called, another word for them is polymorphisms. And so how those genes are turned on or off like a light switch, and I'll get to that in a minute. And then nutrigenomics is how food turns those genes off and on uh, like a light switch. So what we do is we look at the intersection of the epigenetics, which are the genes of you, and how food expresses genes to figure out what caused your genes to trip. Now, I've developed a protocol that looks at four buckets. The first one is pathogenic, so a viral or bacterial or pa uh, parasitic condition can cause your genes to turn on against your favor. Also, emotional stressors can do that, physical stressors, environmental stressors, and of course, food. So those are the big buckets that turn our genes on and off. And so now what we're seeing is all of these nutritional, nutritional diseases based on 
For example, diabetes. They say in the United States, one in three children born after the year 2000 will be diabetic. That's a nutritional disease. One in uh, two people will ha have high blood pressure in their lifetime, nutritional disease. One in five kids now have high cholesterol. That's a nutritional disease. So the big diseases of uh, uh, diabetes, heart disease, which stem from high cholesterol and uh, blood sugar, and the blood pressure are all nutritional conditions. And as well, celiac is a nutritional condition where you can't process gluten and, and it's become epidemic in the United States. They say one in 10 has a gluten sensitivity and one in 133 Americans is celiac, which is an autoimmune condition wherein you cannot break down the gluten protein. That is at epidemic levels. First, I have to commend you for remembering all those numbers. I have no idea how you fit it all in there. Um, okay, so I think the uh, the big revolutionary um, change in our line of thinking that was the when it came to light that our genes can be turned on and off. And I think that's that's a big point that not yet many people know about because I think it was previously thought of your genes were previously thought of as the things that made you who you were but we never really until recently I think um, realized how what we're putting into our body can can impact and change our genes so do you mind diving a little bit deeper into kind of how that process takes place and when you say a gene turns on or turns off what's exactly happening there so for example let's say you have the MTHFR gene expression that is a very, it's an acronym that has to do with the way that we methylate. Now I'm gonna get a little bit into the biochemistry, but I'll, I will simplify it for your audience. So basically when you have that gene, ex, gene polymorphism, which I do, I'm what is called heterozygous, compound heterozygous for the MTHFR. There are two, there are two little branches from the MTHFR. You can have the C677T or the A1298C. That gene is responsible for multiple functions in our body, but one of the big ones is how we process protein and how we bring our neurotransmitters like serotonin that helps us be happy, uh, which then turns into melatonin, which helps us sleep, dopamine, which helps us give us cognitive function, and epinephrine, which is our fight or flight response. Those, those neurotransmitters, which we call actually neurohormones, have to be brought in to the, through the blood brain barrier and they have to be brought in with what I call our helper Bs, which are our B vitamins. And those B vitamins without methyl donors, meaning if you don't have that methyl gene, you need a form of B vitamin that provides the methyl donors so your body can do that. Without those methyl donors, you can't very efficiently process protein and you, you have trouble with neurotransmitters. Now, you can have that gene and not be expressed, but like I said, what we do in our practice is we figure out how those genes get tripped on and off. And one of the ways these genes can get tripped on and off is through stress. We now know that the stress, the adrenaline stress can turn against our favor. We know that viruses in this country, we have a huge epidemic with um, viruses. The Epstein-Barr virus, which is the mononucleosis virus, is now responsible for 81% of those individuals with autoimmune thyroiditis, meaning if you have an autoimmune condition related to thyroid and you have low thyroid function, you have an 81% chance of having the Epstein-Barr virus. We have the varicella roster virus, that chickenpox, that now is responsible for Bell's palsy. A lot of, a lot of paralysis and um, neurological symptoms are tied to the family of the herpes simplex, which goes to the varicella, which goes to herpes virus one or two, which goes to the cytomegalovirus, which goes to Epstein-Barr. So viruses are really turning on our genes. Another thing is bacteria of strep and candida. A strep is a bacteria, candida is a fungus, and they actually live in our gut. It's part of the happy bacteria that live in our gut, but they become bullies in the sandbox through the foods we're eating because we consume so much sugar. And so it's really important to know for example, the MTHFR is a big gene, and now doctors are starting to look at that. They're also looking at our ability to process our fats through COMT gene, our ability to process sulfur compounds. Sulfur is an element that we need, and some of these healthy foods that contain sulfur, such as broccoli and cabbage and 
egg yolks. Well, if you have a gene called the CBS gene or the SUOX gene, those are sulfur processing genes. And if they've been turned off by a virus or bacteria or stress, you can't break down that sulfur to its end state, which helps us think, it helps us build hormones, it helps us with asthma, it helps us with our collagen structure. A lot of arthritis in, in this country, they've done studies and almost 75% of people with rheumatoid arthritis, which is that inflammatory joint disease, has been linked to our inability to process sulfur. And that has been linked then back to these genes that have been turned on against our favor through our food and our lifestyle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we can get our genetic testing done and would that show what genes are turned on and off? What it shows is, uh, actually that's a great question. What it shows is what we have a propensity to be like. So it doesn't necessarily show that it has been expressed. Our, our practice using applied kinesiology or muscle testing helps us discern whether that gene has been expressed or not. And the way we know also is what are your symptoms? If you're having trouble processing proteins, if you're having trouble getting pregnant, um, the MTHFR has been tied to circulating estrogen. And that means that these women are have too much estrogen in their body and they need a balance of estrogen progesterone to keep that um, zygote or that little egg implanted. You may be able to fertilize the egg, but you can't keep that egg in the woman's uterus if there's a um, an estrogen progesterone imbalance tied back to the MTHFR gene. So you can we say that genes in our practice we say genes are potential. They're not your destiny. I love that quote. I've heard you say it before, and it definitely stuck. Um... So with the combination of the, the genetic testing and the muscle testing, to what degree are we, uh, at what, how much knowledge does that provide you with regards to kind of what should and shouldn't this person be eating? It's phenomenally important because we really go to, as you mentioned in your introduction, every one of our clients is bio-individual, meaning that we, we navigate through their genes, we navigate through what's happened in their life, we navigate through the viruses, the bacteria, the emotional stressors, the vaccines they might, might have been um, you know, put in contact with. We navigate through what type of foods they're eating. If they had a huge life event happen, whether it's a death or even happy stress, is still stress. And so we create a very nuanced bio-individual food plan and supplement plan for these for these uh, clients, and they just get better. We are continually amazed by the consistent and sustainable success that we experience in our practice. It's really humbling. Mm -hmm. So I think I can uh, I can assume that you'd recommend everyone go out and get this uh, get the genetic testing done for at the very least, correct? I think it's really important now. What I would say is, you know, the I don't know where uh, Canada insurance is related to genes, but you don't want to label yourself as somebody that has problems with X, Y, Z. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's important. So I would just check with your insurance providers because you don't want your insurance costs to go through the roof mm -hmm. uh, potentially. Okay. Or you may just decide to have one gene tested or three genes tested that we feel are important: the protein, fat, and sulfur genes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that those are very important to, to have. And I say information is knowledge and it's empowering. So I've had my genes tested, my family's had their genes tested. It's really important, it gives us a lot of good information about it. Now, having said that, I'm I'm very healthy. Um, I, was, I got viruses earlier this summer from stress and I got sick, but I got myself a lot better. When other practitioners, we say you don't try to heal yourself, but um, I had all these viruses that turned on in my system through a, a, a stress response as I was having a life transition of my own. And I got very, very sick where I had encephalitis, which means I had brain swelling. My liver enzymes went through the roof. I got complete neuropathy, so it hurt for me to move my muscles. And within two weeks after I figured out what was going on with me, which was the viruses turned on in my system like a Christmas tree, I was able to get better. And I broke all medical conventions of having liver damage level liver enzymes come down to normal in two weeks. Wow. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned that uh, there's three that you, you highly recommend that people check out. What, which were those three again? So the methylation, so the MTHFR, okay. uh, the COMT gene, which has to do with neurotransmission. It has to do with our ability to process fats, which therefore hormones. 
and then the sulfur genes of the CBS gene and the SUOX gene. And my and we'll talk about my wildatarian approach, but in the wildatarian, I've established what I call the big three, and it's protein, fat, and sulfur. Mm-hmm. And that really, uh, really speaks to I would say the majority of our disease states that I see in my mm-hmm. practice. And it's the malabsorption that uh, that's the big issue, right? Yes, malabsorption or it. Yes, so protein malabsorption, which means you can't break down your protein to build muscle, to build tendons, to create hormones to manage blood sugar balance, uh, sulfur, which we talked about before, asthma, ADHD, arthritis, gut problems. A lot of GI issues come from our inability to process sulfur. And then the fat, which goes to hormones and our ability to think because 70% of our brain is made up of fats. And if we can't get to our fats, we're not going to be experiencing our full cognitive potential. So what I want to do is make sure that we uh, we provide also some information that can can uh, support our approach for someone that maybe doesn't want to go out and get the testing done. So what um, are there signs that can can point us point towards maybe sulfur malabsorption, protein malabsorption, fat malabsorption? Is there things that that can tell us that those things are going on? Absolutely. That's a great question. And in my new website, which is under development now, you will be able to take a quiz and figure out uh, what type of wildatarian you might be. So for example, let's, let's talk to protein malabsorption. If you're lightheaded all the time, dizzy, if you have trouble building muscle, if you have, um, if you have burping, if you burp a lot, that's a, a sign of protein malabsorption. If you cannot, um, past your stools if you're constipated that might be or see undigested food particles in your stool that's a sign of protein malabsorption if you smell ammonia in your urine that's a sign of protein malabsorption or even in your in your sweat in terms of sulfur if you eat asparagus and you can smell it coming out the toilet that's a sign of protein that's crazy mal- because how many people are saying that that's normal if, exactly but it's not it's telling you your body can't break down sulfur very well and, and 100% of the French and about uh, 30% of the U.S. population have it. Um, so it's really interesting, depending on, again, you're back to your genetics hmm. and your ethnicity. Another, another thing is if you're really sensitive to salad bars where you have preservatives, if you tend to have attention deficit, if you're significantly asthmatic, if you are arthritic, those are sulfur processing issues. And then fat metabolism issues is if you have acne because the sebaceous glands are over secreting fat, trying to get it out through your skin because it couldn't break it down through your liver and through your gut. Um, If you have bumps on the back of your arm, if your stools are floating or light, if you have referred pain in your scapula, which is the back, right, you know, kind of like our chicken wing back here, that's referred pain from the gallbladder. If you have no gallbladder, <laughs> that's clearly, if they've, it's been, they've taken out your gallbladder, that means you weren't breaking down your fat very well. So those are really great, what I call body talk signals. Our bodies talk to us. We've just not learned to interpret that language. And so in our practice, we call ourselves body interpreters and mm-hmm. detectives. Mm-hmm. And what we teach our clients to do is to become their own body interpreters by educating them to these easy signals that the body is trying to say, hello, somebody look at me, I'm not doing this optimally, and please support me in a way that I can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think the the big thing that stands out there for me is the fact that, well, one, I think a big issue is people aren't recognizing that these are signals in the first place. But of course, what we're looking to do here is spread a little bit more awareness around if these things are happening, maybe we can, we can find the root cause of them. So... What um, what other advice do you have for, for someone looking to become a better body interpreter? Well, I, the first thing is don't ignore your signals. If you're feeling, I cannot tell you how many of my clients tell me I didn't know how poorly I was feeling until I started feeling better. Uh, the body signals are key. If you wake up and you're tired, in the morning, that could be a sign of thyroid dysfunction. If you're really falling asleep and having that mid, mid-afternoon slump, that means that your stress hormone of cortisol or your blood sugar might be dysregulated. So it's really trying to understand. If you're, if you're feeling puffy all the time, if you feel like you have 
bags under your eyes or you're swollen under your eyes, your body's not breaking down fat very well because there's there's edema, there's swelling that's going on under your eyes or maybe your kidneys aren't processing very well. So start being aware and mindful of what your body might be trying to tell you. You know, if you're if, if it hurts to go to walk up the stairs, you know, you have inflammation potentially in your joints. So I, I'm I'm a, a regular exerciser and they doctors after women go through menopause, they tell you, well, you know, well, it's it's inevitable that you're going to gain weight, that you're not going to be able to exercise the way you um, do did before and that you're just, you know, you're going to age. And I say, not so we can be vibrant at any age. And we should be. We should be absolutely. Vibrancy keeps us passionate about growing in our own journey of living and learning. And when people tell you something and I tell my clients, I don't like labels. You know, do not label yourself a diabetic. Mm -hmm. I I know that they have to for medical reasons, but if you can say I'm having a sugar imbalance and I'm going to work through how I might be able to balance my sugar better as, you know, what they've classified as a type two type two diabetic, that's just their vernacular for telling me that I have a sugar imbalance. But we've worked with type two diabetes significantly and have, have had tremendous success bringing down their blood glucose levels and their hemoglobin A1C levels down to normal where they no longer need that metformin. So again, labeling carries a vibration. Every word has an energy wave that then creates an outcome. And so labeling is is something I try to stay away from. We say we're dancing with something, but we're going to try or we're out of balance with something. Mm -hmm. But the body is innately and beautifully, masterfully made to stay or get back to balance. We just need to understand how it tripped and then how to get it back. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I definitely see the truth behind labels leading to an acceptance of, of feeling in a certain way that doesn't feel great. And I, uh, I'm a big believer that we, we should always feel good. Um, and you, like you've uh, you've mentioned all those different telltale signs that something's up. A lot of them people have, and again, they're just they're not looking at it as as signals. They they learn to accept it and don't realize that they can be addressed. Absolutely. And I have a beautiful story. One of my staff members, who actually was a client of mine, a beautiful young lady, she came to see me because she was consistently throwing up and having migraines that were. Um, untouchable by any any doctor she had been to. She'd gone to Georgetown. She'd been to all the best uh, endocrinologists in the area. And she was in high school and she was told she was unteachable. They said, don't even try applying to college. You're not going to get in. You can't learn. You are not smart. They were They were labeling this beautiful and brilliant young woman as someone that could not learn. What we figured out with this young lady, she had significant fat malabsorption. I remember when I said 70% of the brain is made up of fat. She couldn't get to those essential fatty acids to help her think. She's now one of my top practitioners. We call her the, the genius savant. She comes up with these incredible connections. She's becoming board certified. She's getting straight A's in all of her. She's, she's my youngest on my staff. So she's still getting her board certification working under me. This woman is brilliant. And she was labeled that she was unteachable. Mm -hmm. And those stories just are heartbreaking because I see more and more kids that are told that they're less than. Mm -hmm. And only you get to decide as an individual what you're going to be. Nice. So you uh, you mentioned earlier that words carry a a vibration to them. I love that. uh, I love looking at, at the world in terms of energy and vibration. So talk to me a little bit about that side of nutrition. That's a great, that is a great element of nutrition. We now know, and this is Einsteinian principles, that everything is energy. Our thoughts are energy. Our voice is energy. Our food has vibrational energy. And they've done studies that that show, and I believe this is out of University of Pennsylvania, that say when we entertain negative thought patterns, our immune system can go down by up to 50% for up to five hours. 
Conversely, when we entertain thoughts of love and compassion and gratitude and laughter and humor and we're happy, the opposite effect is true. And so just like words and thoughts, food carry a vibrational resonance. And I say our relationship with food starts the moment you make your choice to purchase it, whether it's in a grocery store or in a restaurant. And so if, what I tell my clients is don't go to the grocery store when you're angry because you're going to be you're going to be imparting an energetic vibration to the food and it's going to lower its vibrational resonance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't cook when you're angry. Bring joy into the sacred experience of transforming something from energy to food to energy back into your body to make you able to do what you're going to do during that next day or that next hour. And there are certain foods that carry a higher, higher vibrational resonance. The plant kingdom, those, those foods that are rich in chlorophyll and oxygen. Oxygen is a great carrier of things. That's what makes our blood be so uh, ri oxygen rich. Um, so greens like parsley and cilantro and spinach and cucumber has a tremendous amount of water and we know how energy is carried through water. So cucumber and watermelon, so fresh whole foods have a higher vibrational resonance than food, dead food, pseudo food, for example, animals that have been raised in inhumane conditions. We know that those stress hormones are then pushed into their tissue, which then we eat. It's, it's impossible from a quantum physics and Einsteinian theoretical perspective to think that we are not all connected. And so that we have to honor our food, we have to grow it in a sustainable and loving way that is in, in, um, in line with what nature intended. The whole wildatarian approach is living as nature intended. And we've gotten so far away from that. And in doing so, we've, connect, we've disconnected from that vibrational yin and yang because it is a circuit. We receive and we give and we give and we receive and foods provide the same things. But these dead foods, these pseudo foods, these foods that where they're they're not able to animals, not able to live in a happy environment or plants that are monocropped, meaning that the same seeds are planted in the same space year after year, meaning that you can't rotate those crops and the same nutrients are leached from the soil. The soil becomes nutrient poor. So that next life cycle of that seed which becomes the plant which becomes your food on your table is less nutrient rich and so we really have to get back to basics and honor our food and honor our those that which the areas in which food is grown and how animals are treated so those that then can part a more vibrant and uh, vibrational patterning in us so I think we've uh, we've described at length how much is wrong with uh, with some of the food that we uh, we create and farm. Um, so let's dive into the the other side of things. How do we improve on this? And I think this brings us to the wildatarian approach. What does the wildatarian approach entail? Okay. So I actually coined the term wildatarian, eating, living as nature intended. And the wildatarian approach is living in such a way that is symbiotic with our planet. And it is only consuming those foods that were raised in the wild, that were treating, treated humanely. So wild animals, we are seeing that domesticated and commercially raised animal products now contain these amyloid structures, which are truncated, meaning indigestible proteins. We're eating them, we can't break them down. And amyloids have been linked to Alzheimer's, to dementia, to type one diabetes, to autoimmune conditions. So we eat these things that we can't break down, the body doesn't understand it, it becomes an enemy of our body and the body starts responding with an inflammatory response. Um, these mycotoxins, the way that we grow our crops, so corn, which is genetically modified, the majority of it in the United States, has these mycotoxins. That's a fancy word for saying there's fungus growing on our corn. It's fungus. Fungus really impacts the way we think. It can make people depressed, manic, suicidal. It can leak through our gut and make us have a, what is truly a leaky gut. So. 
while the Tyrion is, is, is a lifestyle that really, really encourages sustainably raised, beautifully grown, lovingly raised meat, grains, legumes, and fruits and sugars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we mentioned you mentioned a few things there, the, the amyloids and the, the mycotoxins. So I'm assuming with the uh, with the wild vegetarian diet, there's less of those, none of those. So we try to minimize the mycotoxins. So the wild game that we really espouse that is a good game is bison and venison and elk and antelope and wild boar and duck and pheasant. And although Cornish game hen isn't necessarily wild, we're finding that a lot of people are able to assimilate that. And it's so important to note that chicken, I call it the dirty bird, at least in the United States, because now chicken has been linked to resistant strain um, urinary tract infections because it's feeding the candida, the fungus that really relates to urinary tract infections. So we're seeing that these amyloids from the chicken are now feeding a pathogenic load in our body. That's a direct link there. Um, That study just came out, I would say two weeks, less than a month ago. Um, The pea protein that so many people use to help, you know, after they work out, they're taking pea proteins. Peas have mycotoxins, green peas, peanuts, which has an aflatoxin. OSHA, which is a regulatory agency in the United States, makes peanut workers wear hazmat suits in the peanut factories because of the off-gassing of these potentially carcinogenic and ill health spores that are in the peanuts. That's why peanuts have become such a high anaphylactic food, at least here in the States. Mm -hmm. What's that mean, sorry? So anaphylaxis means when your throat closes up and you can't breathe. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's uh, definitely linked back to the allergies, right? Yes, exactly. It's a huge allergic reaction, which is life threatening. Mm-hmm. And then I know another one that, that's been a hot topic recently is uh, lectin. Do you have uh, Do you have anything to say around that? The lectins. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it comes back to some of these, you know, beans and so forth. So we've got to look at how we're growing our legumes because the legumes, just by their very nature, are wet. And so we've got to really be careful about that. And phytates, you know, the lectins and the phytates that are found in certain legumes. So the beans that we recommend are the ones that are going to be lower in myo- mitotoxin or oxalates. Oxalates can also impair brain function if there's candida involved, a yeast that can grow in our gut that becomes a bully. Um, we like the we like chickpeas. We like uh, adzuki beans, pinto beans. Those beans tend to be lower in starch and tend to be less moldy, if you will. Mm-hmm. Right. So when I have these conversations, a lot of don't eat these comes up. Um, so just to just kind of summarize, what are the things that should be making up the, the vast majority of our diet? And I know, uh, and perhaps you can speak to this as well, um, what may be best and, and healthy for, for one individual is, of course, going to differ to uh, from another. So what's the, what's the approach we take to kind of determine what it is that we should eat it, be eating and are there foods that we should be kind of focusing on? Sure, that's a great question. Well, back to body interpretation and looking at how your body talks to you. So, for example, if you have a floating stool, if it's a light-colored stool, you're going to stay away from those heavy fats. You're not going to be doing a lot of nut butters. You're not going to be doing a lot of butter. You're not going to be doing a lot of bacon, whether it's wild or not. Um, If you have sulfur, if you can smell that asparagus, you're actually some of these healthy foods like garlic and broccoli, you're going to be minimizing those, those cruciferous vegetables that are very sulfuric. Typically, if a vegetable has a bite to it, like like you you taste with arugula or kale, that's sulfuric. You're going to try to stay away from that. And then again, if you have trouble building muscle, and I encourage everyone to be a wild vegetarian because I've found that it's so that protein is so much more readily processed in the body mm-hmm. that it makes people literally smarter and leaner and um, more fit. Um, so again, depending on who you are, but the ones that we definitely want to stay away from peanuts are just not good. Gluten in the United States has Roundup uh, sprayed on its crops, which is a an herbicide, which is a poison with the, with, with which the journal of American medicine just came out saying it's a potential carcinogen. Why would we ever want to eat that kind of poison? So 
peanuts and those mycotoxins, those peanuts in particular, genetically modified corn. Gluten is a big problem in the U.S. I encourage my clients to eat gluten in Europe unless they're otherwise celiac because they don't have what we have sprayed on our crops in Europe, and particularly France. I really like some flour, and I even encourage my clients to go on the Internet and buy some flour that has been um, made in France, and you can make your holiday your holiday favorite treats with a better flour for you that is still going to taste. It is gluten, but it doesn't have the other add-ons that, um, unfortunately, our – our um, large uh, macro farmers or, or uh, mm -hmm. oh, so it's not even the gluten as much as it is the uh, the things we're putting on it. Yes, exactly. Okay, so with uh, with the mal mal malabsorption, um, you're you're saying avoid those foods altogether, but of course, am I wrong to say that we need fat? We need sulfur. Absolutely do. So that's a great question. So it's not a, it is not a forever avoidance. It oh, no. is a short term rebalancing oh, okay. of the body to give the body a break and to, to nurture it with the majority of foods that are going to be healthy for you. So for example, an egg white omelet in the morning with some cilantro and some avocado and some basil. I had that this morning for, for breakfast. For lunch, I had bison sirloin with a brown rice quinoa pasta, and then I had fresh basil again because I'm using my fresh basil and tomatoes. Tonight, I'm going to have um, lamb and butternut squash. Do I feel deprived? Absolutely not. I'm a total foodie. Last night, I had shrimp. Um, I had shrimp with artichoke. It was delicious. Um, the night before, I had my elk chili over uh, rotelli noodles that were um, that were brown rice noodles. And I travel broadly, and I can find a wildatarian menu item every single time. So wild caught fish, shellfish, those wonderful wild game meats. You can find pretty much lamb on any menu, or bison is becoming really popular. Mm -hmm. And or you can be plant-based wildetarian. You know, some black beans and brown rice and some roasted plantains, awesome. So um, really, you can live very abundantly based. And this is the whole, another another philosophy of the wildetarian is, is flipping the mindset of, instead of I can't eat this, it's like I'm choosing to eat this instead in a bountiful way because my body is really responding in a way that loves this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love and I'm waking up and I have a lot more energy and I can run a seven minute mile and I'm smarter in my tests mm -hmm. um, and I'm doing better at work and I just got a promotion and you know, it, it just, it is a ripple in the pond. So back to that whole vibration, if we're taking in foods that have a higher vibration, we're actually gonna vibrate at a higher vibration ourselves. And then all of a sudden we're, we're are in synchronicity with serving our higher purpose, which then opens doors for you in a way that you that are that is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. There's a ripple effect with this. I love how you speak to it. Definitely, uh, it's definitely important to understand the connection with uh, with your nutrition and and again serving your higher purpose. And um, one of the uh, one of those perspectives that I definitely have seen. Um, be a more effective than the than the alternative is like you mentioned rather than getting into that mindset of restriction and can't and no i think by by flipping things and focusing on what you should be eating and how those foods are positively impacting then it becomes a lot less difficult to to avoid the things that don't serve you in the same ways Yes, and actually with our clients, when we say, well, you can go back and start eating some of these other foods, they're like, no way. <laughs> they don't want to. <laughs> so good. I have a great thing going. I Why feel, I, you know, my, my cup runneth over with options. Why mm -hmm. would I want to go back to that? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Terry, for giving me the opportunity to do that, but I think I'm going to stay right where I am because I'm really happy. That's awesome. I feel so much better. Wow. Okay, so just to uh, to sum up, what does the uh, the wildetarian approach look like? If someone wanted to start with it today, um, how do they go about doing that? So we're coming out with a program in 2018. It, you can get it through my website. It, you'll take a quiz. It'll take you to which type of wildetarian you are. I've developed four major archetypes. 
Um, for now, on my Facebook page or in, on my website, I've provided wildatarian recipes. I've started to put out some wildatarian recipes. We're going to come out with a wildatarian feast for the holidays. There'll be an ebook that'll be out before the end of the year where you can do pheasant and venison and wild boar and duck and root vegetables and this amazing, these amazing desserts and libations that will have your guests going, what cooking school did you go to? But it was easy to prepare. <laughs> there you go. So abundant uh, resources for us to, to put to use. Okay, so Ascenders, I think we have quite a bit of resources for you to, to refer to. Um, you mentioned that the book's coming out next year, but until then, uh, we'll, we'll link to all the, the recipes and the resources that we can find on Terry's website in the show notes. Um, so I don't think there's any reason why we can't go out and start educating ourselves a little bit further on how beneficial adopting some of these strategies can be and of course how can we begin to implement them so Terry, i didn't want to thank you for sharing your wildatarian approach with us i have to ask was it uh intentional that the, your name is found in the name of it <laughs> wildatarian Terrian, yes actually yes and then they say they've been terrified <laughs> 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 awesome. Well, that brings us to the last phase of the interview, the ascending round. So, Terry, what I have here for you is a series of questions, some of them fun, some of them for tidbits of wisdom, and some of them for practical advice. Are you ready? Awesome. Let's do it. So, first one is a book that you think everyone should read at one point in their lives. Wow. I would say um, the book is Essentialism. It really talks about really getting to a deeper place, not going wide, not being a jack of all trades, but really understanding and going deep. It is a, it's a groundbreaking book. Awesome. Is there any quotes that you often think about or live by? Um, the quotes that nothing is impossible. That's one of my hashtags. You know, if I would have listened to the doctors, my son would have not been normal. He would have not been a real game changer on this planet. He's now doing amazing work, doing uh, on the boots, community development, ground groundbreaking work and helping people uh, get out of poverty. So nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And the fact that genius doesn't necessarily come from intellect. We have to think that, you know, the way that we measure our ability to be impactful in this life is so myopic. Genius comes from inspiration. I love that. Terry, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow, that's a good one. You know, if I could have a superpower, I would love to be able to touch people's hearts and let them know that, let them know that they're good enough. We're so in the less than, and so much in less than, and touching that heart has a ripple effect because then it creates a consciousness building. So let them know that they are loved and just touch that heart because it's it's an, it's planting a seed saying, well, what if, what if this is possible for me? What if I could do this? And then lives change. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it aligns so well with everything that, that we do here at Ascend and through Awaken. It's at the end of the day, it's all about just being there for one another and collectively rising to our potential. That's right. So I think um, we can try it, but I think you kind of, in your superpower, uh, answered this question, but I'll ask you it anyway. The last question is, imagine I were to hand you a microphone, but this is a special microphone because everything and any, anything that you say through it will be heard by the entire world. What do you say through the microphone? Um, love. Love has a vibrational resonance like no other. Love can heal. We've seen it. It is it is a it is a physiological truth. Just love. Even even when things might be painful, try to see the love in it. Terry, from all the people that I've asked that question to uh, in the first 10, 11 episodes of Awaken, I think your answer aligns with what uh, how I would respond to it the most. Oh, so thank great. you for that. You're welcome. Terry, I want to thank you for all that you've shared today. Um, I think it's pretty clear that you you know what you're talking about, and um, I personally very much enjoyed the the scientific support for for all that you shared, and it uh, it really begins to help us open our eyes up to what it is that we're putting in our body, and it's uh, 
it makes me uh, it feels good to know that there's a approach that we can we can take that still involves foods that that we'd enjoy and foods that and and a type of diet that that we can still be happy with so I'm waiting for that book to come out. I'm certainly going to get it when uh, when it does. And I hope that the listeners decide to make the uh, the same investment themselves. Before you go, is there uh, where would we find you if uh, if we wanted to find out a little bit more about what you're doing currently? Sure. Absolutely. My, through my website, www.terrycochran.com, T-E-R-I-C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E.com. And when you go to my website, there's I'm giving away uh, Terry's Fab Five for Home and Travel, what you don't want to be at home without or leave home without. And it's an amazing little five little golden gems. I travel so much, I don't leave home without them. Your your uh, listeners will find them to be quite important to have in their arsenal of go-tos for um, your home and travel. Thank you for that. And thank you again for, for everything that you've shared. Take care, Terry. My pleasure. Good night. Ascenders, that's it for my interview with Terry Cochran. I hope you learned a lot from it. I know that I sure did. And whether or not you are deciding to try to approach your, your nutrition with the, the Wilditarian approach, I think there's a lot that can be taken from it that if you begin to implement into your own nutritional approach, I think there's a lot of benefit to be had given all the support and evidence that Terry had offered us. And the other point that I really just wanted to drive home is that our bodies have a lot of intelligence in them and they offer us signs and messages if we're willing to listen for what it needs, what we should probably be avoiding, and just kind of what direction we should be taking to ensure optimal health. So again, just always trying to be aware of and attentive to those signs and you'll find a lot of benefit in listening to the signals that our bodies give us. So be sure to check out the show notes to the episode if you want access to all the resources that Terry mentioned. And you can do so at www.togetherweascend.com forward slash Awaken11. Thanks for listening to another episode of Awaken, guys. Until the next one.